Okay, so um, this is about a, a statistical, statistical disclosure limitation. Just to give you a little background, and I've, I've been in, uh, you know, involved in statistical agencies for a long time. Uh, I think I started back in 1981 at the um, statistical offices. Um, and where are we going from here? So just a brief, I'll just keep a really short overview of what has been done traditionally in terms of um, disclosure risks and, and disclosure limitation methods, uh, risk utility analysis, which we saw a little bit from um, John. And then where are we going? Why differential privacy? And, uh, and it turns out that in the last uh, five, 10 years, when we've been looking at um, sort of automating our um, online flexible table builders, that we're really close to differential privacy. And how do we make that that jump and that step to make our uh, table builders um, uh, differentially private and perhaps other future dissemination strategies and discussions. So this is the traditional statistical outputs, again, in the 90s, 2000s. Um, traditionally, um, agencies, uh, statistical agencies release survey microdata, and they will put that uh, perhaps in, in archives and, and, and uh, allow users to access survey data. Now, it's typically social survey data, not business data. Um, and um, uh, there, as I said, if you're a registered user to an archive, you can pretty easily get access to this data. And of course, um, agencies also release lots of tabular data, and these can be in the form of frequency tables from whole population counts, from censuses are registered. Uh, weighted sample counts, which is not, you know, typically not thought of as disclosive at all, so we're not even touching on that. And uh, magnitude tables, the business statistics. So the types of disclosure risks that agencies are worried about and, of course, are grounded in our statistical legislation are um, identity disclosure, where identification is typically referred to in our statistical legislation across Europe and in the United States and in our codes of practice. And, of course, we make confidentiality pledges to the uh, individuals who are providing us with our data that we won't reveal any sensitive information about you, et cetera. So this is really a fundamental um, risk of uh, disclosure that agencies are worried about. And then, of course, this leads into attribute disclosure. So if I do make a re-identification, what can I learn? What sort of sensitive information can I learn about that individual? And then you don't have to know exactly that about that particular individual, you might learn a lot about a group of individuals. Now, this is typically not disclosure risk per se and very hard to measure quantitatively, but group attribute disclosure is a huge concern for statistical agencies. We don't want to learn confidential information about a, um, a group that may cause harm and you know discredit um, the um, agency. So group attribute disclosure is also very uh, important at statistical agencies. In terms of social survey data, Data. As I said, identity disclosure was the big uh, issue in terms of protecting the data, confidentia confidentiality, um, providing confidentiality methods. And one of the big assumptions at statistical agencies is that they assume no, res no response knowledge. In other words, with, um, the fact of, uh, that you're selected into a sample is not publicly known. And actually, if you are in a sample, don't tell anybody because it's really easy to re-identify people on a basis of three or four variables variables. And typically, they would not use perturbative methods. So up till maybe four or five years ago, the agencies were not thinking about perturbation. And uh, that was, in, in some places, it was even illegal to alter statistical data. So there were, um, most of the protection provided was by recoding, grouping, you might think of it as k-anonymity, um, suppressing or uh, variables such as the high-level geographies are simply not released in the survey data. Um, subsampling was a very typical way, especially because many countries will provide um, sample microdata from their census, like a 1% census microdata. Um, attribute disclosure was of concern uh, in terms of once I make the identification, what can I learn about these individuals? So top coding was very common. Anybody with an income above whatever, $5,000 a month would, you know, have their um, uh, Windsorized, have their values Windsorized and recoding and things. But you really did not see any perturbation going on in these types of um, data sets. Uh, frequency tables, whole population counts. Again, the identity disclosure of the small cells. Hmm? 
You don't consider swapping a perturbation? Um, yes, I do. Well, I'll get to the census counts. Not in social surveys. We never, except I do know in America they do swapping on surveys. That you would not see in across Europe, uh, swapping in surveys. They, um, so, well, we'll get to that and um, that. So, frequency tables now, uh, a lot of time is spent at agencies about how we design these tables, how, we, how the tables are defined, what variables span the tables, how they're grouped in the categories. Obviously, you know, we might have 500, I don't know how many you said, 520 ethnic groups, but at the end of the day, when you see a census table, you probably only have a 15 or 16. Uh, groups and a lot of time is devoted on designing uh, census tables and again traditionally they were hard copy tables right they would be on the web maybe you could get some sophisticated web crawlers or table crawlers to extract parts of the table they but they were hard copy and they were looked at to make sure that um, they were safe um, attribute disclosure in tables is about the zeros and we saw that a little bit with the crap measure it's about uh, what um, uh, learning about who is not so attribute disclosure in a table would be all a table or row, a column or row of all zeros except for one non-populated cell, and that provides the attribute disclosure based on less variables I can identify an individual, and then I learn uh, something new. So traditionally, uh, methods are pre-tabular, uh, and as John said, in the census and the Office for National Statistics, they were doing swapping on the census microdata prior to the tabulations. Um, and the idea, of course, in the tables, uh, many countries are just doing rounding, you know, adding noise in that sense, rounding the, the entries. But the idea was to introduce ambiguity into the zeros. So the problem in sense whole population counts is not the ones, in the t it's the zeros um, that are causing the problems. So, um, and of course, strict control in what tables were released. Uh, so the nested tables were avoided. We didn't want to have any uh, disclosure by differencing. And, and I'm leading up to this because what do we do now for a sort of an online flexible table builder? And uh, you know, where are we going in the future? Magnitude tables is very interesting. This is from business statistics. And in fact, back in the 80s, when disclosure control uh, uh, limitation, whatever country you're from, um, started, actually from the business statistics. And this was about the, um, the fact that the uh, intruders, the adversaries, are actually in the cells of the table. Now we're getting a little bit closer to the definition of differential privacy back in the, with the business statistics back in the 80s, where the adversary is in the cell, it's, it's a competing business, and they want to learn about the other uh, businesses in the cell, um, and there are certain, uh, you know, things that were known, like the rankings of the business, who are the higher, uh, higher um, earners um, and you know, the lower earners. And the attribute disclosure here wasn't called inferential disclosure, it's going to be my next slide, was what can a competitor learn with sufficient precision? So you are starting to see uh, you know, probabilities here in terms of how we protect magnitude tables. Traditionally, again, as it was about designing the tables, minimum population thresholds, the same sort of thing in frequency tables. But here, the protection method, again, the agencies weren't doing perturbative methods. It was all about cell suppression and, of course, very advanced operational research, mathematical programming, you know, because if I suppress a primary you know, uh, cell, um, how do I protect that cell if I have a table and, and margins and stuff? So it was all about um, developing um, uh, advanced methods for cell suppression. Nowadays, well, if we get into synthetic data, there is a bit of a move now in, uh, to, to do the sort of advanced uh, mathematical programming to determine the best cell suppressions, but instead of leaving them blank to actually provide the uh, bounds, the intervals, or actually um, impute a value. So that's coming as well. So that's basically what it's all been about in the 80s and the 90s. Yeah? And you, you mentioned earlier on uh, group, group privacy concerns, but I didn't, I didn't see in the methods that you were talking about um, anything that was... So, yeah, I because I, I just want to keep a brief... So I'm glad you stopped me. So... Um, as I said, attribute disclosure in, in a frequency table of whole population counts is about the zeros. So if I have a whole row of zero, 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 and then one cell that's a, you know, not zero, that could be group attribute disclosure. I might learn that all academics love Britney Spears. You know, for example, um, does that cause harm or not? You know, I don't necessarily um, identify an individual. Of course, if there was a one in that cell, 
then I have individual attribute disclosure. But I could have a row or a column of all zeros and then 1,000 in one particular cell. So basically I'm learning, you know, what is not. And that might cause harm, especially in official statistics when you're looking at, I don't know, eth you know, ethnicity or sensitive questions or income levels or who's collecting benefits, you know, that sort of thing. Is that? Can you give a, Thank you. just a concrete example of where there would be harm? Um, there's one thing that's challenging my intuition here. So what could cause harm is that, um, well, I'm, I'm thinking of um, yeah, tables Everybody where you have pockets of, yeah, exactly, or pockets of ethnic groups. And, uh, and believe me, I think after, I was mentioned that to John, I think after 9-11, they were sort of looking for these pockets of ethnic groups. <laughs> Isn't this like individual attribute disclosure at scale, though? And is is, is group privacy. attribute disclosure something different than a lot of instances of individual attribute disclosure or otherwise? Well, yeah, I don't need to, if I, I, if I have a group attribute disclosure, I don't need to identify you first. I just know that a certain ethnic group is living in this area and there's five, you know, whatever, that might, you know, mosques. If I, if I learn that all academics like Britney Spears, mm -hmm. I learn that I like Britney Spears, right? Yeah, because nobody else, in, you know, in the census table, I mean, if it was whole population counts, it would be different if it would be survey data. Right, but yeah. you're not talking about 90 percent of academics like Britney Spears. That's not what you're calling group attribute disclosure. I'm, I'm talking about that nobody that um, in the cell, I'm learning who does not like Britney Spears. Your inability to give this a precise definition is part of the problem. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you <laughs> says the problem. Yeah. So anyways, I just wanted to give like a really brief overview of uh, where we're going, where we were, so that I can talk about where we're going. Yeah. I'm just going to follow up on that. that the idea that I, I know your ethnicity, you know, that I can guess it with a 50% probability, uh, is a very, the, the attack models on saying, I know this neighborhood is 50% a particular group, uh, may have very significant attacks, whereas saying, you know, I can guess your ethnicity and have it right half the time, may not pose the same kind of risk. And I think that's the, the distinction. Um, so a lot of time, of course, uh, a lot of research back in the 90s, 2000, was, uh, dedicated to uh, producing these types of maps. I, th I, I can't remember what they're called in economics. We called them the risk utility maps. This is Duncan et al. in 2001. And the idea was to, uh, on the y-axis, to have a measure, a quantitative measure of disclosure risk. And on the x-axis, a quantitative me measure of data utility. Um, and uh, we would sort of map our various, we would have different methods and different parameters based on these methods, like adding noise and how much noise. And we could sort of plot our data on these um, um, RU confidentiality maps. And the agency would set a threshold. I wrote the threshold as a horizontal line, but it could be very vertical. It was a very subjective process. There'd be a microdata review board, and they would say, well, you know, if it's a little bit extra risk, we can get much higher utility. So generally, those uh, horizontal lines have more of a slope to it. And basically, they would choose the, um, the uh, release data, which was below the threshold, and basically on the frontier, as we mentioned yesterday. Space for these things? So, uh, for example, so one example, uh, if we are talking about surveying microdata, the disclosure risk is the probability of re-identification. We would typically use uh, models to um, estimate or perhaps record linkage or actually do a probabilistic model to estimate the chance that a survey, an observed unique person in my survey, it's not a problem if there are thousands like him in the population. Taken over. Where's the randomness coming from? From the the so it's um, so based on the um, I have to sort of estimate or infer from my sample what the population counts are. So it's kind of like backwards sampling. So that's one way of doing it. It's a model of the probability. Yeah. Unique in your data. It's unique in the population. So, it's, so in that case, this would be a probability space uh, on my y-axis. There are other ways. Of course, census data, I don't have to model anything. It's quite, you know, <laughs> who's unique or not. But typically, because it was all based on re-identification, it's about uniqueness. Um, it, in, in other words, it's 
LNS also assumes that the records that weren't turned in by a respondent represent a real respondent? Yeah, yeah. Lots of things going on. Another talk. Anyway, but so I think for the y-axis, it's pretty clear, uh, you know, how we estimate probability of re-identification. As I said, that would be the key uh, problem uh, to um, avoid. Um, but the uh, x-axis is very subjective. Now, we don't know what people are doing with the data. And usually, we would use a number of uh, utility measures, like um, how well can I infer a chi-square test, or just doing differences from margins, or total variation, or things that we've um, heard about um, previously. So we might have a number of these uh, maps that we would use. So yeah, that back when I did my PhD, which wasn't too long ago, it was all about how do we model the probability of re-identification, and of course Jerry Ryder was working on that a lot too. So, so um, let me t move forward now to inferential disclosure. So if you go to the old literature uh, on statistical disclosure control, this is mentioned, inferential disclosure. Um, and it was all about confidentiality, confidential information that can be revealed exactly or to a close approximation. So now we're talking about probabilities here. Uh, with high confidence from statistical properties of released and combined data. So the, the notion of inferential disclosure has been around for a long time. And the way the agencies dealt with that was in their survey microdata or in their census tables was just to keep very strict control. As I said, tables were always vetted and they were hard copy and they were put on the internet. And if you wanted an extract from the table, you might have a crawler, but you would, you know, you wouldn't be able to design your own tables. If you want survey microdata, you go register at a lab or a research center, RDC, and you would get the microdata. So it was all about keeping strict controls to avoid this um, scenario of uh, being able to, you know, uh, compose and combine um, sources. So, and what's happening then uh, in the last five ten years is that data is just being locked away. Right, and the governments are, and the legislation is like, we want open data, and and put your data in www.opendata.gov, and so there's this um, tension here between the traditional ways of dealing with statistical data and their confidentiality, and sort of this demand uh, to provide more open and accessible data from the uh, statistical agencies. Um, and of course, you know, things are getting more worse because of the uh, amount of data that's out there in terms of the data environment and what can be used to attack the statistical data. So it's such a, a, a tension um, a, as we, you know, as we're speaking now about uh, how does the statistical agencies open um, access to data. And so it was back, and, and I was reminiscing with Cynthia, I was back in 2005 when statisticians and four uh, statisticians and computer scientists first met, and we had no uh, common jargon at all. But you can see we've come a long way for the you young people who are now in the audience. So it was clear that the agencies needed to think about more rigorous data protection mechanisms with stricter privacy guarantees. Um, and this led to a number of um, collaborations. And I think this is our fourth formal collaborations. Uh, that was the uh, first one. And then we had met in LA. I think it was 2010. And then uh, just in 2016, we had a big program like this at the University of Cambridge. Um, and this one. So, and so we have been looking at differential privacy, and I'm going to show you some examples that I think that you know that really fits in. But one of the key problems when we first started talking to each other, especially back in Bertinor, when we were hearing about these methods, and they were basically you were basically focusing on interactive mechanisms, like how do you count queries? We're you know we collect the data, we want the data out there. We're not going to follow up on uh, how many queries are sent and how do you count them. And so this notion of this interactive mechanism, I think in the beginning was a real barrier for uh, statistical agencies and statisticians to look at these types of methods um, you know, to use for our statistical data. Um, but then, you know, as literature came out, that we uh, saw these, uh, um, the non-interactive mechanism. And this seemed a lot more 
you know, attractive and helpful for us because now I could produce a safe object, a table builder or, or a, um, you know, a private, um, difference between private synthetic data, and then I don't have to worry about, you know, what the users are going to do with this data, and I don't have to count queries and spend privacy budgets. So, so I just wanted to point out, I think it's sort of this mechanism, the non-interactive mechanism, which has sort of, I think, uh, made a, a focal point for trying to introduce these methods into our statistical systems. Did you have a question? I thought I had, thought I had a hand up. So the idea is, can we incorporate the differential privacy into the SDL toolkit? Um, I think there is a need to develop applications which do take advantage of the non-interactive mechanisms. And I'm going to show you an example of uh, what, uh, what is a real possibility, and I think we'll hear tomorrow from the ABS, actually. So um, we're looking at these online flexible table builders. Some countries have them already, um, and the ABS, and we'll hear a lot more, uh, ABS, Australian Bureau of Statistics. Uh, we'll hear a lot more about that tomorrow on the U.S. side as a fact finder. I'm not sure if that's completely interactive or is that also based on um, pre-tabular. So EU has a table builder. You can go on the internet and everybody can use it. And that's also pre-tabular. So basically they mandated um, each member state to produce 150 hypercubes, <laughs> um, which is sort of the underlying um, um, uh, input to this table builder. But the idea in, in a flexible table builder is, is it's a web-based platform. Typically, there'll be drop-down lists in terms of the variables and the categories of the variables. There might be um, some restrictions on the number of dimensions, uh, population thresholds. So the, the uh, system will, if you produce a table and it's too sparse, so there's some sort of underlying um, metrics there in, within the server. If the table is too sparse, so you'll get a message back, go away and produce a new table. Um, but the idea is that the SDL is on the fly. And the idea is you know, it's done uh, through, the, um, through the server. Um, and it was clear that once the agencies start relinquishing some of that tight control on what data is released, that uh, we have to think about perturbative methods. So now we're thinking about perturbative methods, which traditionally, um, well, maybe for census, as I said, they did rounding and things. So it wasn't too, so much of a stretch, let's say. So um, here, as I said, and we are definitely focusing on inferential disclosure. It's definitely relevant now to look at differential privacy. Um, but just to give you a little background, I mean, back in uh, the way that we do these uh, perturbation, instead of just rounding, we, uh, we knew we needed to perturb with sort of longer tails as opposed to a random rounding. And, and so basically we look at a perturbation mechanism, uh, P, where the uh, entries of the... Um, the uh, entries of the perturbation matrix is, are the conditional probabilities of original cell value of I. Given its original cell value of I, what is the probability to move to J? And, and, and I think it was 2009 or 8 when we were in Istanbul, and I was showing these perturbation matrices, and John said, well, that's actually the differentially private <laughs> mechanism. So, you know, things uh, sort of came together. But this is how we've traditionally done it. You know, we flip a coin, and based on the outcome of the random draw, we would move our categories around. So this has been around for a long time. So, you know, again, we've sort of trying to bridge this gap um, on, uh, you know, on some sort of uh, dissemination strategies that can really fit in nicely with the uh, computer science um, communities. So um, as I said, the census counts are non-negative intervals, I integers. Now one of the barriers to differential privacy is that the agencies would not perturb the zeros. And of course that's not going to be differentially private, but it's moving in that direction. So a property of the table builder were that the zeros weren't preserved. There, there were often dimension restrictions, so maybe only three-way tables or four-way tables. So basically, if I had like 10 census variables and I only allow three-way tables, it's 120 possible tables. But the point is, as I said, we can move to a non-interactive mechanism. I know exactly what tables I'm going to allow and what cells I'm going to allow. 
you know so this is this is why um, it's a uh, um, possible to think about differential privacy in this framework. Now, what happened in 2006 uh, in the ABS, and I'm sure we'll hear about that tomorrow, is that they developed a same participant, same perturbation strategy. So basically, think of your census microdata, and each individual in the microdata is going to get a little key, a little random uniform number. And anytime I aggregate that cell together, I will also aggregate the key, and that's my seed. So they will always be perturbed the same way. So you can think, as I said, you know, I've got the uh, perturbation structure, and I'll always, if it's a 10 for this group of people, they will always be preserved to 13, you know, so it's fixed. Um, and so this, again, was a way, even though in theory the um, perturbation happens at the time that the table is called, it's actually preset in advance. So, um, and then another uh, property is that the perturbations are capped. And I see I'm going to have to move along quicker. Uh, margins were typically perturbed separately, uh, which meant that the tables traditionally weren't additive. So there usually was some sort of um, iterator proportional fitting going on. And, you know, so lots of different um, things that uh, were, because uh, users hate non-additive tables. Actually, I think they're getting used to that now. Um, another thing that uh, we worked on is, of course, uh, in order to preserve the margins, at least in expectation, and of course you can also force these perturbations to sum to zero, is to put in this property of invariance, so that at least the margins of sufficient statistics were exactly you know, equal. We would mess up the inside of the table, but they would end up with the margins, so we can put in the property of invariance. And we also looked at various risk measures, which actually were measuring things like attribute disclosure, all those zeros, um, uh, you know, measures based on the entropy, which exactly identifies in an on-the-fly setting uh, which rows or which columns or have degenerate um, distributions. So I'm just going to briefly touch on this paper. This is a collaboration that came out of um, Cambridge last year, and we published it in Statistical Sciences, and Yossi Reno took the lead on this paper. And basically, it was taking that model that I just described, the table builders, um, and how we might make this differentially private. Um, and so again, we're in the discrete case. We have a list of all po possible cells. And remember, I would know all possible cells in advance. It might be millions, but I would know what they are. Um, and we have a discrete mechanism in this case uh, where we're going to change the um, uh, set, the list space from A to B. We're assuming that the structure of B is similar to A. Um, and uh, M is discrete, and, and we started looking at the definition of differential privacy um, uh, in this setting. Now, we looked at the um, exponential mechanism because we have count data, and uh, um, the exponential mechanism is basically discretized Laplace, right? So uh, everything stays integer. Um, so we uh, were motivated by two loss functions, uh, the Laplace, and we also, uh, for comparison, looked at the discretized normal, so I'll have comparisons on that. Um, and then, of course, the utility is minus these loss functions. And um, the sensitivity in this case, it was sensor data, so we um, looked at one uh, was the sensitivity. But the issue here is that agencies still are going to cap. You know, they're not going to allow a count of 10 to go to 10,000. That will never happen. And so this is where the delta comes in by introducing this cap. So, for example, if I, um, I gave uh, some examples of epsilon one and a half, and what happens is if I cap it in seven, you can see that this now is my delta. So you get this nice symmetric distribution. And I gave two examples of one and a half and 0 0.5. So you can see um, uh, exactly what the perturbation vectors look like. Um, and you can see that at zero, where I'm not touching any, I'm leaving the exact count, it's uh, in, for 1.5, it's 63.5% that I'm actually going to leave that count as it is. So, you know, the levels of um, uh, perturbation are not that high once you get into values of uh, epsilon over 1. For a half, you can see 25% of the values are going to stay the same. And then, of course, the tails um, spread out. And, but we're going to cap them, right? So in this case, I arbitrarily said um, 7 to minus 7. And here is an example of um, 
On the top uh, row, you've got the Laplace mechanism, the discretized Laplace, and uh, you've got uh, for an original values on the x-axis here, and on the columns you have uh, two sets of uh, uh, epsilon of one and a half, and then the uh, right side the epsilon of a half, and you have the cap for the Laplace was set at seven, and you can see that uh, for uh, epsilon of one and a half, all my cells are plus or minus two. So we were, you know, so we're not getting a lot of perturbation here. And in fact, uh, one of my messages is that it's actually traditional things that we've been doing to perturb our tables is probably less, uh, that differential privacy definitely wins because we're not, um, it uh, has uh, less bias and less uh, perturbation in some settings. And of course, if we go to uh, 0 0.5, then 96% of the cells uh, will go to plus or minus 4. Now, there is a caveat here because we don't like negative values in our tables, so we're pushing uh, the negative values to zero, so that's why the zeros um, look a little off. Now, just comparing with the normal distribution, I want the same deltas to make it comparable, and of course, the tails are different, and that means the caps are different. Um, and so the Laplace M is 7 and the normal M is 12 uh, means the exact same um, levels of um, uh, epsilon delta, and, but you can see then the normal is uh, not performing as well as the uh, discretized Laplace. Um, so that was clear winner. So it was no surprise that the computer scientists <laughs> chose the Laplace distribution. Um, so as I said, the DP leads to negative values, setting to zero, doesn't impact on our uh, DP, uh, dif differential privacy, but of course it does bias the perturbations. All non-structural zeros have to be perturbed in differential privacy. And then of course it's the margins. What you showed here was just the internal cells, but what if I want to have all three-way interactions, all two-way interactions, all one, all one way, and then the, well, the total would be known. So you have here uh, different, perhaps different levels of sensitivity, and in fact, the agencies can play with various margins if they want these to be more exact or less exact, and you can sort of play with the sensitivity in different areas um, of the table. Now, of course, the same cell, same perturbation is definitely not differentially private because if I have a database and I take one away from the database and produce the same table, they're all going to get the same value except for one. So there are some adoptions here in privacy budgets to spend if we need to consider also the domain totals. Um, but just to show you some applications, now I generated independent tables because that's hard, right? It's hard to sort of reject the null hypothesis of independence. And I generated um, large tables and small tables and applied these, well, I don't know what those lines are, um, and applied these um, um, uh, various uh, utility uh, assessments. On the left you've got, uh, first of all, these are big tables. The average cell size is 100. Um, and you've got uh, the left-hand side the Laplace and the right-hand side the normal. What you have on the top uh, row is the p-value for chi-square tests for independence. And of course, these are independent tables. You've got the Kramer's V, which is the chi-square and the loss function. And it's clear that the Laplace is winning in a, uh, compared to the normal perturbations and also that an epsilon over one is providing us with pretty good uh, utility overall, and of course for the small table, small average cell size of 10 and lots of negative values that we're pushing to zero, this will bias our results, and um, again the results uh, would be um, more problematic. Um, but just to say, it, this is a real census table. There's lots of dependencies in a real census table, and so we really uh, don't see um, that an epsilon over one is going to impact very much on our on the results. Uh, so just to um, uh, say that, uh, again, this issue of margins and composition theories, but just to say that the one big advantage in statistical agencies to look at differential privacy is that it's not secret. And we can compensate for the error in our analysis so if we were doing, for example, testing for independence, and we put this uh, a section in the paper where we wanted to adjust to likelihood ratio test, we would simply put in our distribution, our noise distribution into our likelihood. Um, and of course, you need a solver. It's not straightforward. Um, and uh, we can compensate for the error and carry out a proper statistical test for uh, independence. So just for examples here, you've got here on the upper um, level uh, rows, you've got epsilon of 0.1. 
um, and then below that is epsilon and 0.5, and we generated tables with independent and dependent attributes so that the independent attributes for the original, you can see a 5% um, uh, p-value is fine, um, and the, uh, for the power of the test, that's in 79.3 on the original. Now, what happens if I just naively uh, produce a chi-square test of independence? You can see we go horribly wrong uh, with 86.7%, not our typical 5% for rejecting the null hypotheses. Um, but if we use it, uh, incorporate the distribution of the noise into our uh, likelihood ratio test, you know, we can get down to, a, to have a, um, uh, carry out proper inference. And I show that for various levels of epsilons and, and caps. So that's a really important message, that we should be accounting for the error and the distributions into our statistical uh, modeling. Um, and uh, in some cases, it's, uh, it's not so straightforward, but there are Bayesian methods which denoise the data, which can be used as well. And uh, hopefully that paper will come out in, um, in uh, Journal of Official Statistics. Uh, we did some work with Westat looking at uh, table builders for survey weighted data. Now, the issue of weights, as we mentioned, is problematic because it's maybe dependent on the data, and, but in theory, you should think of the sensitivity as the maximal weight. If we uh, are thinking about differential privacy and the weights don't vary that much, um, and we know that the sample size is public and the population size is public, we can think of perturbing using the average weight. So it's a bit of a stretch, but that basically resolves to the econ um, exponential mechanism as I just mentioned. But basically what that means is that I perturb the sample counts and then I adjust my population counts by using this average weight. So if, if I had, you know, add two to the sample count, I would add two times the average weight. Um, so and uh, basically, we looked at, um, um, as I said, compared that with our uh, methods that's been used at West End and other methods and the post-randomization method that I introduced earlier. And we saw that actually, because those methods are all biased with the zeros, and if the cells aren't too small, um, that the differential privacy outperforms uh, those methods at the same levels of perturbation. So synthetic data is a big area of research that statistical agencies are undertaking now. How do we make that differential private? And you mentioned on the map, uh, and of course we heard about the challenge, uh, differential privacy uh, synthetic data, uh, or we heard from Jorg and John about producing noisy counts and then reconstructing the microdata. To me, it's a, um, my uh, intuition here is to, um, uh, carry out the sort of uh, sequential regression modeling um, and tweaking the estimating equations. That's what I would do. I, we heard yesterday or two days ago with the predictions and adding noise to the predictions, I would probably tweak the um, estimating equations and get uh, safe parameters and then just have your set of predictions from those parameters. Uh, remote analysis servers, I think, might be a way to go. The, everything I said about online um, flexible table building, we can think of having a system as well which will provide safe uh, regression results or logistic regression results. So that's another way to go to provide uh, differentially private um, analysis. So is uh, differential privacy useful in the SDL toolkit? Well, it allows statistical agencies to consider new and open ways of disseminating data. So that's, you know, really attractive. Um, and uh, people are asking, you know, well, should we, should we replace our traditional ways of protecting the data? The sort of notion of five safes uh, that maybe we'll hear in from Australia, uh, coarsening, suppressing, subsampling. And this, um, to me, I don't think we should uh, stop any of these practices, but these, do, these will feed into the privacy budget. And I was happy to hear from John that there was a way to think about a privacy budget if you have a priori sampling going on because, you know, it's not the same as having whole population counts. So we need to think about that. Um, and as I said, I, I think that adding uh, uh, perturbative noise with DP is probably, if you have large enough counts, uh, can ha actually provides more utility than some of our current SDL methods. So that was um, rather enlightening. Um, and uh, uh, I think, well, if you've got this problem of invariance, um, that's being discussed. 
um, so I won't go there. But um, it does provide a formal privacy guarantee for inferential disclosure because this is now, you know, the real problem that, that agencies are facing when they need to sort of open and have more um, accessible data. So challenges, uh, I think the focus has to be in developing the non-interactive mechanisms because agencies aren't going to, don't want to start tracking, you know, what people are doing with their data. Um, how to set these privacy budgets in light of our other sort of standard SDL techniques, uh, looking at synthetic data or remote analysis servers, how do we extend this further to other types of um, uh, statistical data beyond the counts, and then for, as an academic, how do we train our future uh, social researchers and social scientists to analyze messy data? And as I said in my comment, um, the fact that these uh, distributions are known, it's so, you know, it should be so clear that we should be accounting for, uh, for these um, for the noise and uh, and of course this is not a standard course that you have in your master's programs how to uh, how to analyze messy uh, or, or data with measurement errors so uh, it's something we need to think about in the future when we're training our students. Can you go back to your challenges slide? five safes. So if I prove to you that uh, suppression and coarsening necessarily fail differential privacy, why should I hold on? So we still are mandated by this issue of re-identification. And of course, I, why should you hold on to them? Because in some settings, maybe we need less perturbation if you have the non-perturbative methods. Or, or a more, or more uh, with the privacy, you know, you can put in more. The fundamental thing we should be talking about. Okay. Some traditional SDL practices are inconsistent with formal privacy, and the inferential disclosure guarantee is stronger than the re-identification guarantee. But if I did subsampling, which is a non-perturbative method and not differentially private. And, and then I uh, need to, and then I do some noise addition using DP. Would you agree that I would have uh, less bounds on this uh, epsilon? Could I be more lenient on my epsilon if I combine it with other the methods? The condition is that epsilon be finite. Yes. But once you do that, you can't use most traditional SDL methods. I know, I'm not saying on their own. I know that they have to be combined with the DP methods, but I'm just saying that we would be, we could relax a little bit some of the level of perturbation if we had these a priori non, you know, non-probabilistic methods. Every, every step in your algorithm has to respect the rules. Uh, so what does it mean? Sam sampling is right, so it's to a first approximation, multiply the sampling rate times, but you have to have a finite epsilon. Yeah, no, yeah. So, I, so it seems to me that especially those of us who are in statistical agencies can make a lot of progress if we go all the way down to the bottom and say, this is stronger, inference disclosure protection is stronger than inference. Oh, sorry. Well, maybe I just, yeah. I think you agree with that, right? Yeah, I do agree, but maybe I'm just being conservative because, you know, it's just. I think it's not like the, the problem is that some SDL techniques, like sub sampling, work well with differential privacy, whereas other SDL techniques could actually make things worse. I see. And I think this is what John is referring to. So okay. if you apply, uh, I don't know, uh, imputation, uh, if you apply um, whatever, it may actually uh, work against you in, in, in the final result. Or you might do it in a way that actually breaks your privacy loss budget, mm -hmm. which is a real risk. Mm -hmm. So you, you emphasize a lot um, the importance of non-interactive mechanisms. I, I see why that's so important for statistical agencies. Um, but is there still a role for, from the perspective of statistical agencies, for interactive mechanisms for subsequent analysis, reserving some privacy budget for analyses that, like we've heard, that we can't expect the synthetic data to uh, 
you know, support all possible analyses. Um, Ashwin talked about, you know, at least allowing some budget for verification. Uh, you know, maybe in the in the context of RDCs or something. Any, do you have thoughts along those lines? I, I can only refer to John because I don't have the experiences that John is actually having, uh, trying to deal with this in real in real practice. So. You, you do have some relevant experience, so I think you should answer. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to explain to our colleagues what's going on here. And so to me, the synthetic data, I've never thought of, I never thought that anybody would use, you don't see any publications based on synthetic data. To me, synthetic data is to allow users to have data on the internet, to develop their models, but eventually a researcher is going to get access to an RDC somehow. Then you have another set of problems. Yeah. Now you have a set of problems in the RDC, but you know. But you're, you're no, not I mean, yet seeing, you're not in the near term seeing a role for differential privacy in the, at the RDC step, or are you? No. That's where I was going. Yeah, yes, I see that, but no, I don't. The, the, the 2020 census is going to be subject to a privacy loss budget that also applies to any uses after the original uh, release, including those in the RDC. And that's a scary thing when I say it out loud. That's very scary. I don't think any other agency would say that. Climb back down. But it doesn't make any sense to say you did this pristine, well-executed, differentially private public use data, and then you let anybody go into an RDC and do anything they want. And we never did that. We always very technical. Oh yeah, and I'm not saying that it's very difficult to. Yeah. They check the outputs, they have to sign their life away, but, you know, so. But are you going to solve the Feinberg problem? So we have to check to their differentially yeah. private. Yeah. So <laughs> that could be in the Census Bureau, but that would not hold in any other RDC in Europe. <laughs> Publications afterwards are differentially private. Yes, if I can. Okay, great. So the, 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 the hard problem, I believe, with selling perturbative methods in the past has been keeping secret the perturbations, yes. which meant that you could not mathematically verify whether the hypothesis you were trying to analyze was spanned by the space of models that were used to produce the confidential. You can now. So the space of models used to produce the, conf the privatized version of the census has a proper mathematical form once you represent the census as a histogram. And so you can confirm whether your hypothesis, as long as it's from the set of allowable ones, was spanned by what we did. And if so, then you can compute a number with a proper standard error, and that's the end of the discussion. If it's not, then you need to make a case for why the difference between what was spanned by what we did and what you want to do is important, and you have to queue up for privacy loss budget. And then when we do the new, the new queries, then you re you reissue the the uh, confident the, the privatized data updating to reflect those queries. That is mm. in the conceptual design from 2020. But none of that, that's all vaporware, right? right? So that's that's five nice sentences, but you can't do it because we don't have the, the software to do it. We are all bowing to you and following you. <laughs> and of course, we're at uh, a good plug for the uh, panel discussion about where we're going with statistical agencies. And John kindly and, um, volunteered to be on that panel as well, because I know you worked hard on the Tuesday panel. I understand the conservatism, but I really think that we do a disservice to our subject matter expert colleagues by not continuing to point out that the defects in the traditional ways of doing this have to be addressed. It's not, they can't be papered over. Um, but I still think there's a need to do, you know, the probabilistic modeling for the risk of re-identification. It's measuring something else, but, you know, the microdata review boards are looking at those types of measures because that's what's grounded in the legislation. How many, if I give you a survey, what is the chance, you know, that that person can be re-identified? So as Natalie pointed out, these are good discussion for the panel. <laughs> <laughs> so let's save them and let's find this. And we will start back at two.